whole nother level, but still keep it ghetto. Whole nother level, but still keep it ghetto. Welcome to episode 17 of the Process of Hip Hop. I'm Brian Joseph, writer, blogger at the Process of Hip Hop.com. And as always, it's all about the process. In today's episode, I'll be talking to Jay Dange. Jay Dange is an MC originally from Long Beach, California, now residing in Las Vegas. So let's get into it. Like to welcome to the process of hip hop podcast all the way from my hometown, the LBC. Jay Danes, what's going on, my man? Hey, what's going on? You know, how's everything going? Good, good, brother. Glad you joined the show. Wanted to be able to jump right into it and ask you, tell me about your background, man. Obviously, we, we're from the same hometown, same hometown, but tell me about your background and how you got interested in hip hop. Oh, uh, uh, you know, I was uh, raised in Long Beach, California uh, with my grandmother. Uh, I was over on 2030 line, you know, went to Long Beach Poly High School. So, you know, in, in, in California, you had a, in Long Beach, you had a couple things to do. You either playing sports, doing music, or you gang banging. <laughs> and I yeah. chose the Absolutely. sports, I chose sports and music. So I've always loved, I've always loved music. I'm honestly, if I could sing, I'd be an R&B head. But, you know, mm. uh, <laughs> rapping was my, my, my second love. Um, and the, just the music came out naturally and I've been doing it since I was a kid. So, um, you know, it's, it's just been it's something that has helped me grow and, and get through a lot of different things. Um, you know, it's a therapy, it's a therapy for me, you know, help my life move in the right direction. So there's always a point in every artist's career that you stop rapping for fun and you start pursuing a career in the music industry. What was that point for you? Um, that point for me was, I'll never put, I don't know exactly what it was. Um, I was doing a, I did a show at Cal State University in Long Beach with my cousins. It was like a, um, a little talent show they had in the student union or whatnot. And just the reaction that, you know, we got from the crowd, the love that we got at the end of it and what have you, uh, it, it, it made me say you know what let me let me try to pursue this um to make money off of it um and also that's my passion so let me follow my heart and do it like that so that was the turning point for me is just from that reaction and i, I realized that i love that and 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 people being able to hear my creativity uh and relate to it it made me like let me let me move forward with this so you at that point you decided to pursue a career Tell me about the very first project when you actually put some songs together, whether whether it was an EP. Tell me about that. Um, the very first project that we put, that I put an actual EP to, for sale was honestly um, when I moved to Vegas. Uh, I, I got into this group called the Wolf Pack, um, and we it was three of us. It was myself, uh, my, my one of my boys Chance, and uh, my boy Yogi. And uh, our producer, his name was Eric Lyons from the Bay Area. So he put us together because I had just moved out here. Um, Chance was out here already. And Yogi was out here already. So he put me in that in that situation. Uh, we started making songs. It seemed like we jailed really, really good together. Um, and, and, we, and we put it out. From that, uh, we, we were able to open up for, so the show was, uh, uh, we opened up for Little Wayne out here. Um, at the Planet Hollywood, and then the day after that, we had to drive out to Oakland uh, and actually open for Dwayne Wiggins from Tony Tony Tony. So that it started moving like that. So that was the first situation, a uh, project that I put something together in. Now, when you when you started, stop rapping for fun, start rapping to pursue a career. Were you always? I, I find with MCs, everyone has a different process. Do you? write rhymes and then have beats later are you more of a like to hear the beat first then write rhymes to it what's your process with that my process is this i have to hear the beat and and i i don't there's people that can write write a rhyme and then get a beat to put to it but that's not mine mine is i have to hear the beat because the beat is going to tell me the story that i'm going to write about it's going to give me that feeling it's gonna it has to be to me it has to be that perfect marriage they got to go together right that that's a relationship i can't write without hearing it because i don't think it's going to mold together for me that's why when i when you hear my music it flows through 
the track because I wrote to that particular beat and that beat told me what story to write. And so that's how I, that's my process. Do you have specific artists that you either patterned yourself after or that influenced you? Um, I have, I have multiple, like my, my favorite MC of all time is going is Biggie Smalls. It's, it's, it's just the way he, his swag on the beats, his delivery, uh, his storytelling abilities, um, his vocals. Um, that's one. Um, I've always liked, uh, I'll tell you, I'm, I'll take it real, real old school. Um, because you know, it's just my grandmother and my aunt and everything. They had this music. So I listened to it when I was young, um, heavy D, uh, I liked his, oh, yeah. his his flow. Like he, he was just smooth with it, and he did. He didn't just. He wasn't all hard with it all the time, you know. And he had a lot of R&B to it. Um, so I, I maneuvered after that. Um, I love E40. E40 is my dude. I think he doesn't get enough uh, praise. He changed the language of hip hop, the whole language. <laughs> and people don't even give Absolutely. him. Absolutely. They, no. they don't give him GOAT status. He he changed the <laughs> culture of the of hip hop. And yeah. he doesn't get go. Yeah. He should automatically get ghost status because everybody in this game has used his words or two or language at period. Everybody, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I love my Rock Kim's corrupt. I actually met corrupt. That's like one of what is one of my favorite MCs of old corrupt because uh, he was just he was just murdering words. Um, Nas, of course. So I try to stay in more of, the, of that lyricist realm with the with a. Uh, a relatability of storytelling about my life. I don't ever rap about things that I haven't done or been through. Um, so I try to keep it as real as possible to me because I think that, you know, once you get out there and people really start delving into your art and your craft, they're going to start checking to see if that's true and if that's really you. I'm not, I'm not a fake person and I've never been. So that's why I try to, I keep it on my level. I don't worry about anybody else's level. I stay on my level because that's my lane. I'm trying to have my own highway. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. let, let, uh, say that one more time, because it like for some reason I had a bad connection. So, again, kind of just go back to what you were saying as far as yeah, I think you were, I think you said I, could, I couldn't even hear it. It sounded like you said you just wanted to you want to make sure that's kind of representative of who you are as a person. Yeah, like I just you want to make sure your rhymes are. Yeah, I want to okay, make so sure. So just that. Say, say that again and I'll edit. Go OK, ahead. cool. Yeah, I was, you know, I want to make sure that my my lyrics and my rhymes represent me as a person, um, and the reality of myself and my what I've went through and what I've dealt with. I never write about things that I don't know about or that I haven't done, because I think when people, you know, when I get out there and people start really looking into me as an artist, you know, they're gonna start checking facts, and I don't want to represent something that I'm not. I always mm -hmm. want to be talking about something that I've dealt with. And I think that's where people can feel that realness in it and that relatability. And that's where your, you know, that's where that energy uh, gets out to the world and people are, you know, they gravitate to it. Um, you know, I just stay in my level, in my lane. Um, and I'm cool with being the only person in my lane. I, I take the whole highway. Nobody else has to be on it. But as long as someone knows how to, to listen to it, get to it, travel on it, I'm good with it. And it's interesting because something you just said, street credibility has always been part of the rap game. Although I think as hip hop has evolved, it has now become acceptable for a person not to be from the streets. I mean, we're looking at, you know, one of the most popular rappers right now, Drake. I mean, this is a guy who had an acting career, who was on, you know, De Degrassi and various other things. So it definitely has changed. And I think what something you said that also reminded me of is that you can rhyme about certain things to a certain extent, and then people almost want to hear something different because it's like, well, are you still doing those things that you're talking about? So even as an audience, being cognizant of who's listening to your music, audiences are sophisticated. So they want to hear something new versus you having the same type of storytelling and rhymes and Con, you know your whole career so to speak so what you say is definitely definitely interesting and definitely truthful um when did so you your project came out you have music published man it's on itunes and such what was that process like of getting that from you have the project and now getting that getting that that music out there tell me about that gotcha yeah well so 
you know, I, I was in the group. I was in the group for the majority of, of my career. And I never thought that, honestly, I didn't really look at myself as a solo artist. Um, a few years, three years ago, uh, I was going through, you know, some, some, some issues. Uh, I was homeless, um, you know, and I was just out here by myself and, and what have you. And uh, my boy put a, a challenge up on Facebook and I just happened to be on my phone and he called me out as far as doing a, uh, um, doing a, a, a freestyle over a, a beat. And so the next morning I woke, I heard it. So the next morning I woke up, I wrote a 16 bar verse and it was the first time I ever recorded anything and put it on social media of myself rap. I did that felt good and I did that every day for the next six months I called it wake up and bust and it was like very very therapeutic for me um in that people started hearing me and they started gravitating to my to the music and then I was like you know what I think I can do this solo thing I'm gonna I'm do this solo thing right so my situation was just maneuvering around I, I got out uh, to a place where I wasn't hopeless anymore and whatnot and I started putting to this putting this project together and I was just doing it by myself. Uh, found different um, producers. Uh, I found a studio that I can record in. And, you know, it, you know, it was a grind because I had to, you know, save up money and put it in, save up money, put it in um, to be able to put these uh, tracks together. I had, um, and then I got to a point where uh, a producer at Warner Music heard me and he loved my music. He actually mixed and mastered this EP that I just dropped uh, at the end of the summer uh, at uh, Capitol Records and Warner Music. And he did that to me for no cost, you know, just for the love of my music and, and just the, the true, the true hip hop situation. And that's how hip hop was before it was, hey, I know we all broke, but I believe yeah. your talent. I believe and, and I have I have this to offer. I believe in your talent. Let's get together. Let's make some 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 music, some history, and it will make money in the end. And that's exactly mm -hmm. how it was been for me. It, and so once that happened, I was able to, you know, find a distribution uh, and, uh, you know, independent distribution platform. I actually go through um, CD Baby and it's pop it on, pop it on every platform that you can and put it on. And I did a video and all that good stuff. So it's it's been it's been a journey and I'm proud of it because nobody can take it away from me um, because I did it on my own. No one telling me what I can and can't do. Um, no one saying, oh, you got to have this Googles and gobbles amount of money um, be before they mess with you. It was, you know, I'm going to do me and I'm not going to let anybody stop me from doing me. And I don't think anybody should ever do that. If that's your dream and that's your passion, you go after it no matter what, no matter what your situation is. Word, word. So let, let's jump into this music, man. I want to, three songs, you know, you got, you, you definitely have more than that, but I want to concentrate on three songs. I want you to take me through what was the thought process behind these songs, who's on the production, and from start to finish. So let, let's start with bands featuring Masquerade, man. Take me through that. Okay. Um, bands was one of my first songs that I did, uh, that I put out, um, Masquerade is a producer that I, I linked up with through, you know, social media. Him and I got to chit chatting on um, Facebook. Uh, he sent me the track. The beat was just, uh, it just grabbed me immediately because it, it just, it sounded like something that was just, just smooth. The, the, the swagginess to it was just um, impeccable. Um, so, you know, we talked about, you know, how we were going to, you know, put that together. And, you know, he had the hook bands in a bag and that's what you know that was the thing um so i just started writing to that track um and it just it came out i actually wrote that song probably in maybe like 20 minutes maybe mm -hmm. uh and mm -hmm. it just i just i love the feel to it um it, it, it it's bouncy uh they actually played that song out here in vegas in a couple of the clubs a couple of the big clubs mm -hmm. uh chateau mm -hmm. um what was it? i think jewel so it, it was a it was a it was definitely a, a a song that I that I love and I still like once I get back to performing actually performing performing that's probably gonna be one of the first songs that I perform. What is that? By the way, what does that feel like, man? What what does that feel like for an artist? Oh, hold on, say that again. It broke up a little bit. 
what does it feel like when you're up in the club and you hear your song being played <laughs> over the speakers, man? That must be a surreal feeling. Tell me what it, that feels like. It is probably one of the most surrealest feeling ever. Um, it feels like an honor. Like it's, it's. I don't even. Radio is one thing. I don't even care about the radio. I mean, I've been played on the radio, but just to be in a club, your music comes on and you see people start dancing and enjoying it. Just to see that firsthand, I don't think there's a there's not a feeling like that. It was like I was like because I, I happened to be talking to a friend of mine and um, then I heard the, the the beginning of the track come on. I was like, wait, is that my? And, and, it, and it hit, and I was like, oh, no, you know, I got a video and everything. It was, um, yeah. Everybody started going crazy. It was, it was a, um, I don't. It's, it's indescribable. It really is. Yeah. It's a, it's a blessing. It's, it feels just like a blessing. Like, and you know, I, I got out here and people are actually dancing to me. That's what you want to see. You want to see people mm-hmm. enjoying your music. You want to see them dancing to it. When you, when that happens, someone dancing to your creativity, it's like you can't replace that at all. Well, and I think you know, again, hip hop always has had two sides to it. There's always been your party tracks, which I think has definitely been more West Coast. We we tend to have had, have had more of East Coast artists have party tracks, but then you also have that that introspective Rakim, Mostef, Talib Kweli, where it's not necessarily something to dance to, but it's something that you you know you're thinking, and you're listening, you know. So I always like the, you know both sides of the coin of hip hop are are very interesting to me. So it's it's it, but but definitely the club bangers uh, never go out of style, man. So now your second song I want to look at is Never Look Back. And that also has Masquerade on there. So tell me about that one. Uh, Never Look Back. Um, it was just an album that, a record, I should say, that I wanted to to make based on, you know, just the journey that I've had and the, and, and the struggles that I went through. Uh, people, um, you know, there's a lot of people that doubt you. Uh, a lot of people that try to sell you, you know, do something different um, and or don't do something. But the thing I tell people is this, the only person that can live my dream is me. You can't feel what I'm feeling. You can't see what I'm seeing. Um, You haven't been through what I've been through. Um, So I'm going to go ahead and just leave that in the past. I'm going to maneuver forward uh, regardless and and not look back at anything. Because the thing is, is I can't change the past. And the past is what's made me and got me to the point now. So why look back? So that's where that that song came from is it's just it's the pursuit of moving forward and not letting your past hold you captive or people's naysaying hold you uh scared to 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 follow your dreams and that's a kind of a definitely different from bands so absolutely that just shows me you kind of have a wide variety kind of like what we just talked about of of type of songs on there that you are using personal experiences, it sounds like, and being very much reflective of, of your life thus far. So now the the last one, Can't Finesse Me. I'm, I'm interested to hear, because I love the title of this, man. So what went into Can't Finesse Me? Tell me about that. Can't Finesse Me um, is with a producer named Riff Raff the Great. He's out of L.A. Um, I actually uh, met him through my brother-in-law. Uh, I did a song with my brother-in-law, and Riff Raff was the uh, producer on that, and he heard my mm-hmm. verse on that song, and he hit me like, "Hey, you know, <laughs> you want to do some work? I got some work if you want to, you know, some tracks." And I was like, "Man, whatever you got, send them to me. I work fast. I got a, a lot of songs." Uh, so he sent that to me, and what it's about is a lot of different things. People want you to go out, and for instance, the record industry is part of this. They want you to be able to go out, get fans, get this, get that, get everything, and then take all your money. So they want you to go get that cash. They want me to go bring it back, you know, so they can take it. And it's not about that. You know, I'm, and I'm saying that that's, that's not me. That's never going to happen. You know, I, I walk on my own feet. I stand in my own lane, right? I don't care how good you think you are, what you think you're doing. I'm not the one that you can work over. I'm not going to sign no crazy deal. I'm not going to work for somebody and they get in the lion's share of everything, but I'm doing the lion's share of the work. It's just, you know, fall back. 
you know, I got this. So recognize who I am as a man, as a person, as an artist, uh, and we good. Yeah, you kind of just alluded to this right now, but what is your feelings about the current state of the music industry as it relates to hip hop? I think that they have convoluted hip hop. Um, I think that they didn't, I think they should have separated the genres, but what they did was they took hip hop and they threw everything in that same bowl and called it hip hop. Not everything is hip hop, there's different levels of it, right? The hip hop is a culture. Uh, it's a way of life. That's a lifestyle. Um, but they try to make it into, oh, it's just this kind of music and that kind of music. No, it's not. This is hip hop is probably our only true culture in this country of America, right? This that's the culture that we created. That's the lifestyle that we created. The attitude, the 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 the, the fight, the the you know politicalness, um, it's everything. It's 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 a way of life um, that they made into. Um, they try to keep it into a hip hop uh, a genre of music. And then now you throw in the mumble rap, you throw in, you know, all the different kind of rap styles that, that are out there and people get confused. And in that, they started disrespecting the old heads, the OGs, you know, the people that, that our forefathers that brought before, that came before us, that opened up the doors for us. Like, if you think about it, hip hop is the only genre that, you know, we talk about the older head hip rappers you know that you know oh he can't rap he's too old for this he can't do this so now you pushing them to you putting them out the pasture where you look at rock and roll they be rocking today 80 90 years old and people still loving them and going to see them yeah. and saying they're too old to do this or nothing r&b same way they can sing to their 80 90 years old they're not saying they're too old to do this right anything country you know, on down the line but when you get to hip-hop to ours they try to control it and i think that's the that is the record labels because hip hop is probably the most influential uh, art of music in the world. Uh, Absolutely. We, 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 can, we control masses. We move thought processes. They put it in every music, all kind of music. They put it in commercials. They put it in everything, Absolutely. right? Mm -hmm. So it's, let me get my hands on this hip hop because they get a little too powerful. And that's where you see, you know, the Tupacs and Biggies getting killed because they seen the masses and the people that they talk to and people following that, we can't have that. So we gonna now saturate the market, we gonna change it. We gonna push out the old heads that were actually thought and conscious uh, savvy to be able to try to push the movement of people to do the right things. We need to get them out of the way. That's not what we want. We wanna put the pill popping, lean sipping, I don't, you know, disrespectful to women, gangsters but ain't never been a gangbanger in their life but want to keep continue to glory, glorify it but they ain't been even, wasn't even raised in the hood they want to throw that narrative out and they want to control it because that's what people are listening to so I think that um, my thing that I, I've been trying to do is I, I want, I, my style is different, I, I can rap on everything I got a couple pop songs that I rapped on I got, I'm working on this country track you know, uh a country hop track that I'm rapping. I don't ever want to be pigeonholed into anything, and I want to. And I don't want anybody to be able to control my narrative. So, I think that once we start recognizing and respecting this culture and this art form, that's when we'll get back to the greatness um, that it should that it should be at. And it's not far from it. It's just people get lost real quick because they follow the masses instead of doing their own research. And what happened? Now I know you're still on that grind, man. So tell me what's on deck for Jay Dange in 2020. Uh, I, I'm working on another project right now. I got. I'm actually. So I was talking about Riff Raff the Great. He's actually uh, coming up with out with uh, uh, Riff Raff the Great Volume Three. Um, uh, and I'm actually going to be on. I think five of those uh, songs on that project. Get Like Me Volume 3 is the name of it. Um, I'll be five, about five of those songs on that project. Uh, I'm also working on my own follow-up project. I'm looking to probably put it out in June. Um, got a lot of work. My son is actually rapping. Uh, so I'm, I got, uh, he's putting out a project next year, early next year too. So I'm on three of those songs. Um, so it's just, it's just hustle, hustle, hustle. Um, I'm still trying to think of a title for my next album, but it's probably gonna have 
probably about uh, 15 tracks on it. Um, I have over 300, 400 songs. Uh, and I continue to write on a daily basis. I record almost every day. Um, and I write fast. I got a song with uh, Kareem Rush. He used to play for the Los Angeles Lakers with yeah. Shaq and Kobe. Yeah. I got a song mm-hmm. that I did with him. Um, mm-hmm. Two songs, actually, that he's uh, you know finishing up and going to be putting out. Um, I did some, um, I got some uh, radio shows that I'll be doing interviews on. Um, and I got a couple, I'm going to be doing uh, two, two music videos probably in February. Um, so um, I, I got a lot of work, man. I, I, I just, I love to do this. It's, it, it doesn't stop for me. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a full-time uh, situation for me, a, a pair of couple with, you know, the other things that I'm doing. But, you know, I do it for the love of it. I, I do it because it's, like I said, it's, a, it's, it's, it's therapy for me. It's therapeutic for me to be able to create something and know that it is the only one of its kind in the universe. There's a healing power in that. Because nobody's yeah, ever done that. No one, any word that you speak ever is the only word that's been spoken by a being in the universe because you're, all, you're unique to the universe. So everything you do has only been done once. And when people can sit back and look at the awesomeness of that and the awe of that, I think it changes their thought process in, in how they maneuver. So what I create is the only one of its kind, and no one has done it. So you know you can look at it like you be in awe of everything you do. Go, okay, go back and say when you when you can go back and look at the awesomeness. Just kind of take it right from there. Gotcha. And and so go ahead. Cool. Yeah, when you can go back and look at the awesomeness of your creativity, uh, and what you've done, and know and realize that it's the only one of its kind in the universe because you're you're that one unique being in the universe of yourself and no one has ever done it before you can and you truly respect that and look back at that it puts things into a different perspective that life into different yes, perspective indeed. you maneuver differently once you can realize that and there's a peace in that there's a therapeutic feeling in that of this is me and no one can take it away from me and I'm the only one that's ever done it. Well, when you release that next project, man, I'm inviting you already. Come on back to the process of hip hop, man. Best of luck to you in the future. How can people stay in contact with you? What's the best way? Absolutely. Um, I'm on uh, every social media thing. Um, Instagram is jdanes23. On Twitter, same thing, jdanes23. Um, Facebook, jdanes. Um, so they can reach me on any one of those platforms at any time. Um, I, I respond to everything that's sent to me. You know, I, I, I try to stay connected with my fans because without them, I wouldn't continue to move where I'm moving. So you got to show the love to people that's showing love to you. And that's how that's what I believe in. Well, again, best of luck to Jay Dange from my hometown, Long Beach, California. Big ups to you, man. And we'll uh, we'll talk soon. Absolutely, man. Appreciate you. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Process of Hip Hop. Join us next week for our next episode. The Process of Hip Hop is produced and edited by me, Brian Joseph. Executive produced by Dale Harewood. Music by DJ Big Mike of Real Side Records at realsiderecords.com.